Are we live, Naresh? Yes, sir. We are. We are live, sir. Yes. Hello. Hi. Good evening, uh, uh, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for the IIS Academy Corner uh, monthly webinar for this October. I would like to welcome our two moderators, Dr. Uh, Karthik Raj, who is originally from Coimbatore but at pre present practicing in Dubai, a senior arthroscopy surgeon, uh, and. Uh, and Dr. Uh, we have Dr. Soham Mandal from Kolkata, a uh, senior arthroscopy surgeon. And we have uh, three speakers. Expert talk will be given by Dr. Raju Ishwaran from New Delhi, senior arthroscopy surgeon. And we have Dr. Nitesh Kehalot from Jodhpur and, uh, and Dr. Jyoti Prasant from Kannur. Over to you, uh, Dr. Soham and uh, Dr. Karthik, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. I think this is a great session, great learning session for all of us. I think I would uh, ask Dr. Raju, sir, to please start his uh, expert talk. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to the Indian Arthroscopy Society for this uh, kind invitation and allowing me to share my views. I just like by note of confirmation, is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, sir. Absolutely it's visible. It's clear. Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. So I'll be speaking on uh, posterior shoulder instability, which is uh, becoming more common with the increased participation in sporting activities. As orthopedic surgeons, as sports surgeons, we are more used to the commoner anterior shoulder instability, but then we are likely to get posterior shoulder instability too in our day-to-day -day practice. And uh, through this talk, and this is just a posterior soft tissue uh, shoulder instability, in the form of labral tears, I have not addressed bony causes of posterior shoulder instability related to glenoid uh, retroversion and other issues uh, because they are far less common than the more common soft tissue uh, posterior shoulder instability. Now, uh, when it comes to uh, the posterior glenoid, uh, we need to realize that it is a different animal. It's not a mirror image of the anterior glenoid. It presents differently in a clinical perspective, and that's mainly because of well-established anatomical differences between the anterior and the posterior glenoid. Uh, the very first thing that strikes in the posterior capsule is that it is less robust than the anterior capsule. So the posterior side of the shoulder is actually more vulnerable than the anterior side uh, when it comes to recurrent instability. And just like the anterior shoulder, you have static stabilizers, you have dynamic stabilizers of the posterior uh, shoulder. The static stabilizers, again, are weaker than the ones found in front, but that is the uh, posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, the posterior labrum, the bony constraints, and uh, the flexed and the internally rotated position, as opposed to the abducted and the externally rotated position, that loads the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, and that leads to posterior instability in uh, sports and other activities. The dynamic stabilizer, it's interesting, the most important dynamic stabilizer of the posterior labrum actually lies anteriorly. And of course, it receives a huge contribution from the scapular muscles and the normal scapular rhythm. The subscapularis is said to be the most important dynamic anterior stabilizer of the posterior labrum. And that's because of the phenomenon of concavity compression. That's something that we are all familiar with. Uh, the glenoid and the humeral articulation is an articulation which is waiting to dislocate. We all know that the humeral head is three to four times the diameter of the glenoid. So how do you contain the humeral head within the glenoid? That's by the power of concavity compression. That is when the humeral head is pressed into the concavity of the glenoid by whatever mechanism, uh, you need a greater amount of force to translate the shoulder either anteriorly or posteriorly. So it follows logically that if there is any event which decreases the concavity or if there's anything which decreases the compression, that will increase the vulnerability of the shoulder to dislocation in whatever direction that uh, decrease happens. Now, in the case of the posterior labrum, if you have a posterior labral tear, your concavity is reduced. If you have bone defects in the posterior side of the glenoid, your concavity is reduced. And similarly, if you have a weak subscapularis, the compression is reduced and these are important to know because uh, you don't uh, immediately treat a patient of posterior shoulder instability with a surgery. Uh, you offer them rehab and uh, this gives you guidance in rehab that you can uh, ask the patient to strengthen the subscapularis, particularly if you don't find an anatomical cause for the posterior shoulder instability. So whenever there is a decrease in the concavity compression, in this case in the posterior direction, the humeral head 
can uh, translate posteriorly in response to the same force which would not have caused it to budge previously had the concavity or the compression been intact. Now, uh, reduced concavity, as I mentioned, could be due to labral tears with or without bone loss. Bone loss, thankfully, is uh, very less common in posterior shoulder instability. But then the commoner bony problem is a bony or a chondrolabral retroversion that can, of course, result in a reduced concavity and lead to vulnerability to dislocations. Scapular dyskinesis, subscapularis weakness are the common causes of reduced compression. Now, if you look at any CT scan or an MRI axial image, and uh, this is a very common CT scan image uh, or an MRI image that you will get in your studies, you should appreciate the subtlety in contours between the anterior and the posterior glenoid. Now, if you look at the anterior glenoid and the anterior glenoid bone loss, it happens typically at a 90 degree angle to the glenoid axis. So it's, it's almost uh, like a perpendicular drop off. If any of you have visited the uh, beach in Vishakapatnam, it's a rocky and almost a perpendicular beach, uh, very unsuitable for swimming, but very suitable for creating a natural harbor or a naval base for that matter. Whereas on the posterior side, the bone uh, loss happens in a slightly sloping manner, typically at an angle of 30 degrees to the long axis of the glenoid. So this is in sync with any beach that you would like to see, uh, a gradual sloping surface and the interface to the water. Uh, so what it implies is that the same amount of bone loss on the anterior side is far more significant than the same amount of bone loss on the posterior side, because even though the bone is lost, the humeral head still has a sloping platform on which to glide and the patient may not be that symptomatic. So this is one difference that you need to appreciate. And if you translate that into surgical terms, most of us would have done more anterior glenoid surgeries compared to posterior glenoid surgeries. So if we are able to put an anchor in the anterior glenoid, it is far more difficult uh, to do. And therefore, if you want to put an anchor in the posterior glenoid, I think it should be much easier than putting an anchor on the anterior glenoid because there you have to maintain a constant angle. Uh, otherwise, your drill is just going to sky walk. In the posterior glenoid, you can just place the drill guide on the bone and generally it will go in the right direction. Because if you see this shelf of bone, Bone provides a lot of wiggle room compared to this very narrow piece of bone in the anterior side. So this is illustrated beautifully in this anatomical specimen. So in this specimen, uh, this is a recent paper in the American Journal of Sports Medicine just published uh, two months ago. They used a finite element modeling and they found out what percentage of bone loss is critical in uh, posterior shoulder instability. And if you see, they have created, uh, this is I think a 14% glenoid bone loss. And uh, if you appreciate the sloping surface, quite opposite to what is seen in the anterior glenoid where the defect is at perpendicular uh, to the long axis of the glenoid. So this is something which is one anatomical distinction between the anterior and the posterior borders of the glenoid. And uh, therefore, if you look, they have uh, simulated a posterior labral repair using uh, multiple sutures. And uh, again, if you look closely at the interface where the anchor is put, uh, you see a lot of wiggle room. So you don't see a sudden drop off as you would see on the anterior glenoid. There is a gradual slope, even if there is bone loss on the posterior glenoid. In fact, the findings of this paper was that even if you have up to 19% bone loss on the posterior glenoid, just a soft tissue capsulolabral repair is enough to contain the humeral head for most activities of normal life and athletic function. And uh, this is something visible on x-rays as well. So this is uh, a Barnage view taken from one of the papers uh, uh, that I published. Uh, but then if you, again, appreciate the differences, this glenoid bone defect is at right angles to the long axis of the glenoid. And if you imagine something similar on the posterior side, it will be more sloping. So that's the anatomical differences between the anterior and the posterior glenoid that we need to factor uh, when we treat these patients. And uh, coming to the clinical peculiarities or the clinical causes, again, no major surprise, acute trauma, repetitive microtrauma, generalized laxity are the three common causes of anterior or posterior shoulder dislocation. It is believed that uh, seizures uh, and electric shocks result in more posterior dislocations, while statistically the number of anterior shoulder dislocations is more, but that would constitute as a case of acute trauma. It depends upon the arm position at the time of the incident. If the arm is in a flexed and internally rotated position, the seizure activity will cause the humeral head to dislocate posteriorly. If it's in a more abducted externally rotated position, uh, it will cause it to dislocate anteriorly. 
Repetitive microtrauma is what we are more likely to see as sports surgeons. A uh, lot of sports which involve the arm in the forward flexed and internally rotated position can result in posterior instability. Generalized laxity is a rare cause of posterior shoulder instability, but still something that needs to be kept in mind. And uh, biomechanical studies have found that an angle of 60 degrees with respect to the scapular plane is the one which maximally loads the posterior labrum, as opposed to the common sense thinking of 90 degrees of forward flexion. So that's again a factor which needs to be kept in mind during rehab. So common athletes uh, that we may see uh, complaining of vague pain in the shoulder, particularly at the back of the shoulder, they would the one thing in common would be they would be participating in sports like uh, boxing. A lot of people who go to the gym and do bench press, uh, they will tell you so. Again, bench press is something which can uh, be painful in both anterior and posterior shoulder instability. If the patient tells of pain in the start position, that is when the rod is close to the chest, it's more likely he has anterior instability. But if the patient complains of pain towards the end of the movement, then it's more likely a posterior shoulder instability is the cause. Swimming is a very common sport uh, with posterior instability. A lot of water sports like uh, rowing, uh, people who do a lot of push-ups can land themselves with posterior shoulder instability. Wrestling is one sport which involves a lot of overhead lifting. Uh, these kind of patient profile are the common ones that you may find in your clinic complaining of shoulder pain. Should at least think of some problem on the posterior side. Now, the diagnosis is made difficult by the very vague nature of symptoms and they are less symptomatic. In fact, uh, the only patients with posterior labral uh, tears who will actually come to you are athletes because the normal Joe is not very symptomatic. The gym going person will simply stop going to the gym or start doing cardio and not lifting weights, something like that. They will uh, adjust their lifestyle around their problem. They typically report of deep seated pain and they will specifically complain to you that when they perform the specific athletic activity, the pain flares up. A lot of tests are described. Uh, all of these are provocative tests. Essentially, the labrum is torn posteriorly. You are trying to load the labrum in various positions of uh, flexion and internal rotation. This is the Kim's test. Uh, this is the jerk test. Uh, again, a lot of it depends upon a relaxed patient, your examination technique, and some of them may only be positive under anesthesia, especially the test like a posterior load and shift test. Of course, when you will assess a patient of posterior shoulder instability, uh, do remember to check the other common signs, uh, signs of anterior shoulder instability, sulcus sign, etc., which uh, make the patient more in the category of a multi-directional shoulder instability. Isolated posterior shoulder instability is still a less common entity than a multidirectional instability. Uh, we'll see the video of this particular patient, but this is the MRI of a patient. Uh, he is again a gym goer. Uh, he wants to big, uh, he wants to build big muscles, and uh, he was doing bench press. I think with uh, nearly 90 to 100 kilograms weight, and uh, he reported of pain in his shoulder. So the MRI, a plain MRI is generally uh, sufficient. An intelligent radiologist will point you towards the size of the side of the pathology. So when I saw him first, I was reluctant to operate upon him. I subjected him to nearly five months of rehab under a dedicated shoulder physiotherapist. He did a lot of rotator cuff work, scapular work. And only when he didn't improve, uh, we'll see later in the video uh, what was done for him. So again, uh, I like to operate in the lateral decubitus position. You could do this in the beach chair position as well. But if you are doing it in the lateral position, it is important to reduce the amount of forward flexion because forward flexion will translate the humerus posteriorly decrease the amount of space that you have to work. You generally need to make uh, four to five portals. In this instance, uh, four portals have been made. And what is important to realize that due to the smallness of the glenoid, a lot of work on the posterior side can actually be done from strategically placed anterior portals. So these are the four portals that are used, uh, the Wilmington, the posterior portal, the anterior superior, and the anterior mid-glenoid uh, portal. I'll just run you through the video. So the anterior mid glenoid portal is placed in the standard manner, but the antero superior portal I like to place very high up. Now, when you're doing an anterior shoulder instability, you will typically like to have this needle coming somewhere here. But for a posterior shoulder instability, try to make it as high as you can because this is your primary viewing portal. And then this portal should be made in line with the biceps so that you are able to switch in front of and behind the biceps. 
And there you see a very clear, uh, a big uh, posterior uh, labral tear. The good thing about these tears is that you don't need too much mobilization work. Unlike an anterior instability, again, it's probably because the glenoid is vertical, it allows the labrum to fall off. And uh, you therefore need to elevate the labrum and uh, you need to bring it back. Uh, here it's a sitting duct. It's just lying there. You just need to repair it uh, by making strategically placed uh, anchor portals. This is the Wilmington portal. And I generally don't like to use a cannula in the Wilmington portal. So this portal is created partially through the rotator cuff. We have to accept that, that a little bit of rotator cuff uh, incision uh, would happen with this portal. So if you put a cannula, that to an eight millimeter cannula, uh, it's a lot of iatrogenic damage you are doing. So I like to use a half pipe. A lot of us operate the knee as well. So this is the same half pipe that I use for meniscal repairs uh, available uh, with all major industry players. And again, as I said, placing an anchor is not a challenge. If you are conversant with anterior labral work, I think posterior labral work will come very naturally to you. The only slight bit of awkwardness comes in when you want to view this properly. And all this is done from the antero superior portal. So you can see that uh, uh, the viewing is not compromised and you don't need to take very deep bites or try to create a very big bumper. Uh, you just need to reattach this torn capsular labral complex back to where it belongs. So basically, the rest of the steps are pretty straightforward, and uh, they are a mirror image of what you would normally do for the anterior side. One difference, uh, anterior capsulolabral repair, I like to use a double-loaded anchor. Um, here, I, use, I will probably use three or four single-loaded anchors, uh, mainly because I don't want to really bunch up the repair. But despite my best intentions, you can see that a little bit of soft tissue bunching does happen. And uh, the key to prevent a lot of bunching from happening is to start the bite right where the labrum ends and where the capsule begins. So that's the first anchor gone. Uh, I think two more anchors will be put. Uh, if we are running short on time, I can probably stop here. Otherwise, uh, this just video is one more minute remaining. Typically, two to three anchors would be good enough. You could use whatever anchors you want. And here again is a good learning point. Uh, this uh, particular bite is being taken by the bird beak. And as is true with uh, any anchor-based suture retrieval, you may think that you have caught only one suture. But then if you find that both sutures are moving, you have potential to unload the anchors. So therefore, you need to use something like a probe as a retractor, retract the tissue back, uh, see the sutures properly, ensure that there is no movement, really the basic stuff, no movement at the anchor. That's the posterior capsulolabral uh, repair done. Uh, three anchors, fairly robust repair. The rehab protocol is typical of what I would follow for anterior shoulder instability. Obviously, the sling used is different. You need to immobilize the arm with a certain degree of external rotation. This is not an ideal splint, but an aeroplane splint is very inconvenient to the patient. So this is the most convenient contraption that I found in my practice uh, to keep the arm in slight external rotation. Uh, with this, I end my presentation. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. And if there is any questions or discussion, I'm very happy to take it forward. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, your interesting uh, talk. Yeah. Please, Dr. Karthik. Yeah. 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 Raju, sir, you made it sound very simple and easy. That was a very sleek and excellent presentation because I think uh, though well coined and said, posterior labral repair are not, especially for the beginners, are not very common in day-to-day -day practice and they when I attempt to go a repair, it's not as easy and your tips were very sleek and uh, well demonstrated. A couple of questions I think must be from the uh, audience and, and we will also like to ask you, as you rightly told, uh, always the that was a beautiful point point to us about the anatomical difference between anterior and posterior. But while going on to placing an anchor, especially when you want to go way down inferior, postro inferior and all those things. Uh, any other tricks? Have, have you had instances of using these curved anchors, curved guides and that have been helpful enough? There are different journals talking about very low postro inferior portals. How low is too low? Are they really necessary or it is just about, as you rightly demonstrated, pushing the head little anterior, creating more space, uh, this thing. We would just like to have an expert tip from you on this perspective. That's a great question, Karthik, and I have not found the need so far to use the curved devices even for anterior labral repairs. 
probably because the time when I started, these were not available. So out of necessity, I have modified my technique uh, to be able to reach that portion of the glenoid. In a lateral decubitus position, I suspect it's not that difficult. Uh, beach chair, I've never attempted, uh, but the same tips would apply. Essentially, the humeral head has to be translated a little anteriorly. I mean, normally we keep the arm in the flex position. So it is very important that the surgeon himself position the patient because once the patient is in traction and if you are coming only to create the portals, uh, you may not be able to correct this intraoperatively even after recognizing it. Uh, yes, a curved cannula is a good thing to have. How low to go? You can only go low until the six o'clock because then the margins of the glenoid would converge and uh, you really would be encroaching on the anterior territory. So I generally don't aim for a particular spot, uh, just the lowest point where it will go. And I visually guesstimate that I'll be able to place at least three anchors. Ideally, one should have at least three or maybe four fixation points on the posterior labrum. Uh, ordinarily, I would have used a double loaded anchor and tried to create six fixation points, but I feel for posterior labrum, it's a bit of an overkill. That is perfect, I think, sir. That is perfect. And there is a, one more addition to my question, I would rather say, like how we talk about medializing the footprint of the anchors, uh, slightly 2 mm into the glenoid, which is quite of importance in the anterior. Uh, do you feel that is a really a concept of importance in the posterior side? This is one part of my question. And second part of my question, especially we see a subcategory of patient where in the early B1 glenoids, where they have a posterior translated head and also they having a labral tear. So how, how, how do you manage? Do you, do you really go in for these at one shot when they have a little bit of retroversion and kind of a posterior translated pre-arthritic, of course, uh, straight away to a labral repair or do you wait and watch? How do you go on these two ball games? So to answer your first question, Karthik, uh, in the posterior glenoid, you just need to place the anchor right at the edge because you are not hoping to achieve a huge bumper. On the anterior side, your concerns are different. You aim to achieve a superior capsular shift and uh, you aim to tighten up uh, really the anterior band of the IGHL. So on the posterior side, if you noticed in the video, that's my usual practice. I place the anchor right at the edge. Uh, a fish mouth kind of a guide is very helpful in this regard because it can just teeter off of the edge. And if there is a glenoid bone defect on the posterior side, I will actually place my anchor in the defect because it's a sloping defect. I know that my drill will go through and uh, I will be able to place my anchors. Now, coming to the second part, the pre-arthritic or the arthritic shoulder. Uh, so the importance of subscapularis in posterior shoulder instability is probably best highlighted by the shoulder arthritis. Because in shoulder arthritis, unless we do a complete uh, 270 degree release of the subscapularis, uh, our patient is not going to be happy. And because of the tight and the contracted subscap, the humeral head goes back. So that again underscores the importance of subscapularis in the instability situation as well. I would uh, never be very eager or very hesitant to take my scalpel to any posterior shoulder instability patients, let alone a pre-arthritic case. Even this boy, I treated him non-op for nearly five to six months. And only then I took him up for surgery because it's a different animal. Uh, he came to me just because he has the desire to build big muscles. Had it been a typical office going person, he would just have modified his lifestyle and most people will happily live with a liberal tear with minimal symptoms. That, that beautifully answers the question. I think it is a thought to be ceded to every young surgeon who's attempting to do that. So, uh, uh, any other questions or we shall we uh, go on to the... Uh, sir, Ramakant here, sir. Uh, <coughs> Raju, sir. Yeah, yes, Ramakant. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, excellent presentation, sir, as usual. Uh, very clearly demonstrated and explained, sir. And uh, my question is, um, usually the posterior labral tear is also associated with some kind of paralabral cyst. So any clinical presentation or a surgical technique or rehab difference of, uh, you know, routine repair, like isolated uh, this thing or any difference is there, sir? So Ramakan, that would be typically the case with a postro superior labral tear, which is in a way a type of a slap tear or a slap variant. Uh, this is a postro inferior, the reverse bank card kind of a lesion. Generally, these are not associated with paralabral tears. But if they were, all you need to do is extend the release and uh, decompress the cyst and do the same repair. So no difference there, but I would find it exceedingly rare, rare for this kind of a lesion to be present with a paralabral cyst. And uh, rehab, sir? Any difference rehab, in the rehab? 
the same as anterior shoulder instability i generally get the rotator cuff firing early because obviously the there is no problem with the rotator cuff i avoid the forward flexed and the internally rotated position uh, passive movements and active assisted movements for the first 4 to 6 weeks and i place them in this external rotation sling that i feel is important otherwise the normal uh, tendency is to place them in the internally rotated position if you noticed carefully in the uh, first day post op uh, photograph where i showed the portals uh, the hospital had placed them into a standard shoulder sling in the internally rotated position i literally shouted at my uh, resident and then changed it to a externally rotated uh, position so that is a more important thing in my opinion how long sir 3 weeks or 6 uh, weeks i would give it, it for at least 5 uh, to 6 weeks Five to six weeks. But I would get them off the sling uh, every now and then to do their exercises. But I will caution them against the uh, internal rotation in the forward flex position. Okay. Okay. Will... Sir. Thank you. Uh, I will just have a small uh, question for uh, Raju sir. Uh, excellent presentation, sir. Posterior dislocations are definitely a rare injuries and difficult to manage arthroscopically. uh as uh, compared to the anterior uh, instability do we find more increased external rotation before the repair and the external rotation comes to normal when we repair anteriorly because we are taking care of the capsule also so have you found in your experience that in posterior dislocations have there been more increased uh, internal rotation or reduced internal rotation because of the injury and has that changed when you have after you have repaired in uh, post operatively So I don't notice any change in the rotational movements because the pathophysiogenesis of both these things is different, and I'm very careful to not take any capsular bite uh, because that would really restrict uh, the internal rotation, and you'll have an unhappy patient. It is very easy to over tighten the posterior labrum even with minimal of effort. I mean, honestly, with this much of a bumper, I was. not very happy i would have wanted a much more flatter or low profile uh, bumper and that's the reason why i don't use a doubly loaded anchor for these repairs okay okay i'll have a one last quick question for rajesh sir i have one one small question uh, one small question rajesh sir, uh, sir we have yes. this uh, sub category of uh, posterior instability especially these uh, controlled epileptic patients where they have a huge tear and also a reverse hill sac lesion now uh, as you rightly told our threshold are very high for posterior bone blocks so we'll work. in a soft tissue what is your threshold you would like to have when you want to add on a mclaurin's procedure to a posterior labrum repair do you do you have a, do you, because uh, we we are in anterior we are quite clear with tracking and thousand we can of course do the same kind of a reverse tracking for this as well but there are little technical discrepancies so what is your clinical threshold level to add on a mclaurin's i have a very high threshold level to do anything on the humerus and i remember treating a patient with bilateral posterior dislocation sustained during an epileptic seizure conservatively simply because at the end of his neurosurgery and everything he simply had no symptoms at all so don't be afraid of treating them conservative perfect sir uh, so hum you had one question sir if there is a associated anterior labral tear or a slap tear as well mm -hmm. would your order of uh, repair how would you like how would you like to do your order you know the posterior first or the anterior first would that you know influence your surgery in any way in case of the posterior repairs true so it's a 270 or a massive pan labral tear i would do the anterior first and then uh, move on to the slap and then the posterior again no signs to it it's more a matter of convenience we are more comfortable doing the anterior work probably most of us can do the anterior labral repair and half the time we take to do the posterior labral repair so finish that off first and then move on to the posterior another right. obligate advantage is that uh, once you tighten the anterior structures it is easier to take the bites from the posterior just like we observe in a, a multi fragment uh, fracture reduction so once you reduce the comminution it is easier to plate right i think for matter of time we'll uh, start moving ahead to the case presentation excellent it was an excellent presentation by raju sir i raju sir I one more question excuse yeah, me yeah sir. yeah yeah yes dr uh, sir the, there is a question uh, from youtube uh, chat box by dr mojambil siddiqui he is asking bony procedures on posterior side are indicated only for 10% bony loss as compared to 25% on the anterior side why so uh, i partly answered that in the presentation and i would like to correct it they are not even indicated for nearly 20% bone loss on the posterior side 
because the pattern of bone loss is different. It's a sloping bone loss compared to a vertical bone loss. So that is a pattern of bone loss, which is more amenable to a soft tissue capsulolabral repair. And I would encourage uh, the person who asked the question uh, to read the American Journal of Sports Medicine. Uh, I think the August issue, the July, sorry, the July issue uh, from where from uh, which these uh, images were taken. They have done a finite element modeling plus a cadaver study, and they have shown that up to 19% defect on the posterior glenoid can be very reliably managed both for activities of day-to-day -day life and athletic function by just doing a soft tissue capsulolabral anchor based repair. I think I think that beautifully answers the question. Uh, we'll go ahead to the case presentation. I think it is by Dr. Jyoti Prashant and it is going to be a rare case of posterior femoral condyle osteochondral in injury. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, Jyoti. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is the screen visible? Yeah, it's visible. It's sound and clear. Okay, right. So I just wanted to, this to be a much more uh, of an interactive session because I will stop in between and I will uh, maybe I might need suggestions from you. So uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present this case. Um, in the forum of Indian Arthroscopy Society. So it's a case of how we manage the rare case of osteochondral fracture of the lateral femoral condyle. And uh, is my screen visible? Is it visible? It is, it is, okay. it is very So it's good. a 16 year old female who came with a twisting injury of her left knee while dancing. So, notice an abnormal positioning of petella, which was self-reduced. So, on asking, uh, we had a history of uh, recurrent dislocation of petella. And this time while dancing, she dislocated her petella. And with that dislocation itself, she fell down. So, uh, she came with the pain and swelling and went to a nearby hospital, took some x-ray and was referred to our hospital. So, the initial x-ray was not there. So, we took a CT scan and this was the picture we saw in the CT scan. So... Uh, we got a big osteochondral defect on the posterior aspect of the femur and uh, this is what we saw in CT and this is a uh, other axial cut so the CT in which it is the fragment is displaced and uh, this is another picture you can here you can see the entire uh, piece is intraarticular and this is another uh, this thing that shows the MPFL injury also the severe effusion of the joint and the MPFL injury also was there and this is another view of the MRI. And so what is the management? So I would like to keep it as a discussion. So how will you manage it? Will go open or arthroscopic? If open, which approach and uh, which all implants we can use for this? So it's just open for discussion in this case. So please, uh, I think uh, I want some inputs from everyone because I would like to, this to be a discussion. Uh, I would just weigh in uh, at this point, uh, seeing the imagery, I think uh, I would prefer an open approach. Uh, it's a big fragment and it's lying, it needs to be attached to an area which is very difficult to uh, go arthroscopically and operate arthroscopically. I think uh, I would prefer an open approach and uh, there is an Henderson approach to the knee on the lateral uh, side just uh, that approaches uh, the posterior aspect of the uh, the HOFAS fragment we use. That I think can be used and that exposes the uh, posterior part of the femoral condyle effectively. I think uh, that would be my uh, approach to the case. Okay. So anyone else who wanting to do an arthroscopy or... I think I would also stick to Nitesh. It is quite a big fragment and uh, the, the position is quite, uh, of course, obviously we should start by doing a diagnostic arthroscopy, seeing inside if, if it is possible to have a look on overall. But I think fixing it would be a little bit of tough in uh, arthroscopic, all arthroscopic perspective. And open would be much sleek and because in this such an angle, what is important is more getting an anatomical uh, of reduction into the osteochondral fragment. I would also stick to the open. 
Okay, and what will we do for the MPFL? The MPFL can be reconstructed, of course. Uh, and uh, it would be uh, better, Jyoti, if you could use it uh, as a full slide. Uh, that will prevent uh, from giving away the next slide. But I would agree with uh, what uh, the opinion both the speakers have, uh, both the panelists have chosen an open approach. Uh, I would probably use the Roger Bade approach. You could also use the Henderson approach. It's a minimally invasive approach. Of course, it's the lateral side, regardless of which approach uh, you use, the vessels are nearby. Uh, that is something, and this would probably be visible to you in the MRI cuts as well. I think in nearly 96% of instances, the neurovascular bundle is located to the lateral side of the midline. Uh, but you may have some, if you are lucky, it is located then to the medial side of the midline and you can approach the lateral side without a problem. So with a uh, heavy heart, uh, yes, an open approach uh, with very uh, close attention to the neurovascular bundle patient in the prone position, I'll probably not even attempt arthroscopy, do a straight ahead open approach. Okay, so actually, I also went for an open approach. Uh, I went a posterior lateral approach to the knee. The fragment, what has happened is uh, to my utter um, despair, the fragment has gone through the notch anteriorly. And actually, it was an avulsion fracture of the ACL, which had buttonholed anteriorly. Okay, when the I searched the literature later on, then I knew that I got a few case reports in which you get a, a dislocated patella and then what happened that with the dislocation, the patient falls and the ACL gets hours from the posterior lateral aspect to the femoral condyle and this ACL with the attached fragment gets buttonholed anteriorly. So I got there and I was really realized that I can't take the fragment from the posterior aspect because it has been attached to the ACL and it has gone through the notch underneath and it is stuck anteriorly to the knee. So now you are... The clever person in this room is carpet then. Yeah. I will just tell. So I was uh, actually stuck. I just put the patient prone and I did a posterior approach and I couldn't find the fragment because it has gone buttonholed anteriorly with the associated ACL attached to it. Now what do you do? I think once we know that it is an ACL avulsion, all the more it uh, puts a pain. As uh, Raju sir uh, rightly pointed out, uh, a diagnostoscopy could have got us the knowledge, but even my place, I wouldn't have dreamt of thinking this uh, in say, and you have rightly chosen posterior. So obviously to the, the trick is to get it out, retrieve it, and then, and then uh, fixing it all in place. Uh, so yes, posterior approach. So, uh, I couldn't get it out through the posterior approach because it was buttonholed anteriorly. So, I, with a heavy heart, I actually, I knew that if I go anteriorly, then I could do, uh, take the fragment out, then I can also repair the MPFL. That was the advantage through the anterior approach. So, but the thing is that since the ACL is attached to the fragment, I need to cut the ACL portion so that I will get it free from, when, when I go anteriorly. So what I did is that I just kept a stump of the ACL in the posterior aspect and I closed the wound and then minimally closed the wound and then turned the patient's wound pipe and then I opened up and then I went, took the fragment out and I repaired the MPFL and again made the patient prone and then I fixed the fragment with a bioabsorber screw and k -wear. Actually, this happened to me, so uh, uh, that is why I wanted to uh, discuss this case. So I went in and I used bioabsorbable screws and bioabsorbable K wire around, and so that um, I got a good fixation over there. This is a posterior uh, when I took the fragment, and then I repaired the ACL, remaining portion of the ACL which I had tagged initially in the posterior when I cut it. I had tagged and repaired it properly, and uh, it was really nice. That is because I got a real good, nice result. See, so this is a pre-op and this is a post-op CT. Um, I was really afraid that uh, how it is looking. So that is why I went for a CT because in X-rays, I was not convinced. So this is a post-op CT looking very much reduced with all the bioabsorbent screws and KYs surrounding it. The biocompression screws of Arthrex. And uh, this is a post-op CT. You can see the posterior aspect of the knee. It is perfectly reduced there. And I kept this patient. This is a, um, I took a follow-up, six-month follow-up because I wanted to know whether... This is going for any avascular necrosis. So I went uh, and took a six-month follow-up MRI also. 
and um, and the, see, you can see that the MPFL is also really the petal is really nice centered there, and uh, the MPFL is also repaired. So actually, two surgeries were prevented. So later on, if the MPFL reconstruction needed to be done, it would have been done in a second sitting. So obviously, when when I went for anterior approach, I finished the MPFL repair also in that setting, and now it is um, good that we got the reduction and also the MPFL back. And you can see that there is not much of avascular necrosis. There are, uh, the patient is really happy and the real good range of movement is there. And she has started with her dancing. Now uh, it's one year follow up now the patient we have. So as a management of posterior osteochondral fracture of the femur, and sometimes it's the careful consideration of the fracture characteristics and might uh, need arthroscopic and open techniques to restore artificial this articular surface continuity uh, to preserve the tissue and uh, facilitate healing. So thank you, thank you. So open for discussion. Well, very well done, uh, Jyoti. And uh, as a matter of coincidence, you are from Kannur, and I was uh, watching Kasar Gold uh, before uh, joining the <laughs> webinar. And uh, this case has more twists and turns than the movie Kasar Gold. <laughs> okay. I, uh, as uh, Rajasa rightly pointed out, it was uh, excellently demonstrated. I think it's a learning perspective for everyone. And and the healing, I really love the... Uh, that's one thing I think in pediatric, it has taken up and it is beautifully healed out there. Good. So, uh, do we have any questions in the panel or shall we go to the uh, next presentation, please? I think we can move on to the next presentation because he made it so interactive. No questions. <laughs> yeah, there's no, all, all are dumb mouths. <laughs> Everything is clear. <laughs> yeah, all just but one question to JP. Yeah, we, yeah. We were please. not able to go through the MRI slices properly. What was the ACL? It, you, it healed off or I. I yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. The ACL healed very well. So you it mean to say, well. uh, just for I, our... I didn't have that slides in it, huh. but this healed very well. I have now, uh, actually in this case, I have uh, sent for a journal for publication. So good, good. Uh, hopefully it will get published uh, within just, one or two months. Just for our understanding, you did yeah. a mid-substance end-to-end repair. Is that what you did, right? ACL. Yeah. Actually, uh, when I go anteriorly, I thought that I will have difficulty in, um, because the ACL is still um, there. So ACL, I wanted the ACL to be back. So I cut it uh, a bit, yeah. leaving a soft tissue uh, stump, uh, just like we some cut uh, external rotators while doing a hip arthroscopy, arthroplasty. So Correct. we uh, just to repair it so that I will catch hold of the other part and I will uh, suture it. I had a, a labral scorpion. I tied a few, uh, took a few bites from it and I reattached re it. And I actually, I explained the patient that you might need two surgeries. You might need to do an ACL later on, but I never needed to do it. So, so actually, I, I have explained for a stage procedure for the patient. So that is what, that is why they were also happy because they got rid of one surgery. So I told that uh, that's the most MPFL or ACL. All these, any ligament, you will have to do it in a second stage after six months. After healing of this chondral lesion, you will have to do it in a second stage. But they were so happy that they got it done all together in a single stage. I think this is also a learning point. Uh, quite Sherman's type 2, type 3 tear, hydrogenically created, repaired and heals. And this is a perspective we need to understand re ACL repairs as more of a point as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, really. In a pediatric age group, ACL yeah. repair heals yeah. really well. And this is a very a classical example. And after only this case, I read regarding papers and I found out case reports regarding this ACL avulsion. Similar cases were reported. So I didn't know it when I was on table. Uh, later on only I got with Weiser. Thank you, Dr. JP. We are waiting for your paper as well. As okay. Dr. Sandeep told, one matter of time, we'll move on to the next interesting topic. We have Dr. Nitesh here. So he would be talking in, so on Save the Head, SCR and Massive Irreparable Cup Day. Wow. Now, lovely topic. Handing over to you, Dr. Nitesh. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll just start sharing my screen. Uh, I hope uh, the screen is visible. Uh, just yeah, I hope the screen is visible. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I, will, uh, I will start. So my topic is basically, a, uh, I'm just presenting a case of massive irreparable rotator cuff tears. Uh, we, the traditional treatment 
have been after the introduction of uh, reverse shoulder to shoulder arthroplasty, we have been uh, going straight away to that. Barring a few indications, we are doing, and it gives a, a good result. But recently, Dr. Mihata has given us uh, the superior capsule reconstruction, and the initial results have been uh, good with that. The purpose of this is to illustrate that uh, in few specific cases, we can actually save the head. We don't need to uh, straight away go to a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. And we can actually uh, get a good result. So starting with the patient details, a 56-year-old female, the right side dominant hand was involved and uh, the complaint was severe pain while lifting the hand. She had a weak external rotation. The American Shoulder Elbow Society score was 38. The VAS score was 9, very high. Dash score 68 and the constant was 30, as well as very low. She had a lot of disability. So this was the affected side and this was the normal side. So the external rotation was reduced. She had to move her whole body to do the external rotation. The abduction also was affected. On the normal side, she was able to lift until then. So she didn't have a pseudo paralysis as a typical definition. She didn't have a pseudo paralysis of the forward elevation and abduction. She had an external, external rotation lag as such. So we went for the radiology. Uh, we can see slight superior migration of the head. Uh, rotator cuff arthropathy falls in the grade of Hamada stage one and two. And the acromial human distance came to between five and six millimeter when we measured it. Going for the MRI, the supraspinatus tear was present, pathic grade three. It was retracted to the uh, superior part of the glenoid. Subscap was intact. So, the class, uh, according to the classification, it was a pathic grade three. The fatty infiltration on the T1 weighted MRIs, uh, the coronal, uh, the sessional images. The, it was Gottlieb grade four, both supraspinatus. The tension sign was positive for both supra and intraspinatus. Now, what are the options for this female? Now, we have arthroscopic cuff repair. That is the straightforward go-to. But uh, the problem with this, uh, this option in this case is a severe retraction of the rotator cuff. And the Gottlieb grade four, that means the uh, chances of uh, re-tear after repair are very high. It comes in a massive cuff uh, repair uh, diagnosis. So the functional outcome is not going to be good. It, it has been shown by now many studies. In, if you operate in a Gottlieb grade 4 patty infiltration, it does not improve. And the, due to retraction, we are bound to find, uh, we are, will not be able to reduce the cuff to the footprint. So the, those are going to be a big problems doing arthroscopically. So we rolled it out. Balloon spacer is now coming up in recent studies. Uh, a lot of centers are now doing uh, putting it arthroscopically. The balloon spacer in initial results has shown quite good uh, functional outcome. All the long-term studies are still pending. It is still, the technique is still yet to be refined. The implant is still under a refining phase because few implants have given very adverse effects in the patients like dislocation of the balloon from the subacronous space, allergic reaction to the balloon, Bursting of the balloon and, uh, and leakage of the fluid, all these have been uh, have happened and have been reported. So we ruled that out. Reverse total shoulder arthroplasty is definitely a go-to option in massive rotator cuff repair, uh, massive rotator cuff tear patients. The specific indications of reverse total shoulder arthroplasty in massive cuff tears is a pseudo paralysis in abduction and forward elevation. Then there is a Hamada grade three and four osteoarthritis rotator cuff arthropathy that we call it. If that is present, then it is a go-to option because the patient is still early. In the studies uh, that have been published, if the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty is in younger patients, that is less than 60 or 50 years of age, there is a higher chance of higher chances of failure and the uh, division rates are higher as compared to the patients who are operated more than 60 years of age. So we decided that we want to save the head. As the uh, glenohumeral arthritis is not that severe, it's only stage, uh, grade one and two, we have the intact anterior and posterior compression in the form of subscap and the intraspinatus anterior minor. We only have the supraspinatus majorly torn and severely retracted. So we decided to go for a superior capsular reconstruction in this patient. We, uh, we took a facial ata graft harvest from the same side of the thigh I operate in the lateral po position uh, arthroscopically, so it was fairly easy to take the graft on the same side. 
the graft got harvested, measured, it was bundled upon itself, and then uh, the thickness came out to be around six millimeter at the maximum, and uh, uh, maximum around eight millimeter, minimum around six millimeter. So this was a fairly uh, good thickness. And uh, now the second, the important part that comes in is to pass the graft inside the joint. Now we need to have anchors over the glenoid. We need to have anchors over the greater tuberosity. We have to pull the graft through the lateral portal and then pull the sutures out through the nevisor portal and then the graft place and then tie the sutures. So this is what was done. The graft was prepared. The graft was, now the sutures were passed. So these are the sutures that was pulled out of the lateral portal. And these are the sutures which are of the glenoid anchors. So one limb of each anchor was taken. The specific mulberry knots were put, put so that the sutures does not slide through the uh, graft when we are pulling the graft inside. So our plan was we put the mulberry knot, it's put, uh, it stops on the, on the graft and then we pull the opposite end of the suture so that the graft slides inside. So these mulberry knots were, uh, were put on both, the, uh, on both these sutures. Then the other threads, the lateral, uh, the lateral part of uh, the anchors, their threads were also passed through the graft by using the scorpion uh, from Arthrex. And all these limbs were passed initially. So all the parts of the limbs had to be passed outside. You cannot, uh, it, is, it becomes very difficult and nearly impossible to do, it, do this uh, intra, when arthroscopically when the graft is inside because this occupies a lot of space. You, you pass all the sutures through this. Then you start pulling the graft like this as we did. And then all the sutures were passed. This is the final position when all the sutures have been passed from the medial and the lateral aspect of the graph. Then we start pulling the graph. We start pulling the medial, uh, the medial uh, you know, limbs of the threads, which were passed through the middle part of the, of the graph. And these were the glenoid anchor limbs. When we start pulling it, the graph goes inside to the lateral portal. One thing important is the lateral portal has to be widened significantly uh, for the graft to pass. You cannot do it through the uh, through the, your anchor, uh, through your uh, cannula. The portal has to be wide enough so that this big graft can pass through it very easily. So when the graft passes inside, you keep on pulling, the graft passes inside, and we, then the graft is fully seated. You can check in uh, uh, intra-arthroscopically also, the graft is seated. So the next step is fairly simple. You uh, try, tie all the knots, first the medial knots, then the lateral knots and the graft sits, uh, the lateral anchor knots and the graft sits on uh, uh, easily. So these were the post-operative x-rays, the medial anchors and the lateral anchors and the humerus head has definitely come down as compared to the pre-op x-rays. This was the follow-up at one and a half months. The patient was started initially for passive physiotherapy at one and a half months, passive active exercises were started. Pain was immediately gone after the surgery. That was probably because of the subacromial irritation and subacromial impingement. That was relieved completely. At one year follow-up, we had a she had a good moment. She sent she had sent this video from uh, her home. She was uh, she didn't come for the follow-up, but she was able to do all these activities painlessly. There was absolutely no pain. That uh, I talked to her. And that was a uh, most significant achievement from the patient's point of view. She, uh, her main complaint was not the function. Her main complaint was the pain. Although we have restored a lot of function after the superior capsule deconstruction. The graft side healed unimentally uh, and there was no problem there. This was the one year follow. -up. And a slight proximal migration of the head can be seen. And a lot of studies now have also uh, said that a slight the wearing of the graft happens, thinning of the graft happens with time, but the thickness of the graft comes into play in that area. If you put a thinner graft, then the failure rates are higher. If you have more than six to eight millimeter thick graft, then the, uh, the success rates become more. So the graft sustains well. The take home points from this case would be, the superior capsule reconstruction has shown good results, but still it is in the short term studies. We need to see a 10 years or 15 years outcome yet. There is need to select a perfect, perfect candidate for the surgery. If the patient has a significant Hamada grade three or four osteoarthritis, then there is no point in doing this surgery because the patient will still have the problems and still have the pain. In that case scenario, you can straight away go to a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. The important uh, thing during the surgery is fixing and suturing the graft. That has to be very good because that is important for good healing. 
and the thickness of the graft has now been shown uh, in uh, in vitro and in vivo studies that it has to be minimum of 6 to 8 mm that gives you good results thank you I think excellent talk by Dr. Nitesh. I think it was mentioned in Mihata's paper that the minimal thickness was around 6 to 8 millimeter. I think they have a prospective study as well on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Excellent talk, excellent results. Uh, one question. Uh, was the patient a little bit old for the SCR? I agree. So, uh, I agree with your point. Uh, but actually, my decision was based on the status of osteoarthritis and the glenohumeral uh, joint because uh, it patient was also a bit young for reverse total shoulder. Agreed. So, Agreed. So, so uh, I think and my point of view was if it, if it paled, then I can still do a reverse total shoulder later on after probably 10 years. That True. would give a good result. True. Dr. Nitesh, uh, it's a very nice presentation. Can I have one question, please? That is... Uh, in the glenoid, um, rather than putting metal metallic anchors, uh, could you opt for a rather maybe a all suture anchor so that even if it cuts through later on, it might produce less damage? Uh, why did you choose a metal anchor? Uh, that is my question. Uh, I agree with your point. Uh, my point of using the metal anchors in that uh, these are the Arthrex anchors, and these uh, anchors have a very good hold. So when uh, the glenoid anchors are the pulling anchors, we are pulling the graft uh, by pulling the middle limb of the thread. So they need to have a very good hold. My In my experience, the metal anchors have always have a very good hold, although uh, soft tissue anchors and all suture anchors also have a good hold. But in this particular case, although there was no reason uh, to go, go against that because all the studies that I have uh, read at that time, uh, the case, most of the studies have used the metal anchors. That was the only reason, but there was no solid point going against that. My personal uh, view was they, they get a good hold. So when I'm pulling the graft on the medial side, so they have very less chance of coming out because uh, in an older age female in India, a lot of osteoporosis is bound to happen in the bone. Dr. Nitesh, excellent presentation. We were very happy. Just two clarifications on the case itself. Uh, I understand it was an irreparable supraspinatus, infraspinatus. What is the scenario of the TDs? It was a complete loss of extra, I mean, teres was intact, teres was gone. Teres was intact. Actually, infraspinatus was also uh, quite a bit intact, actually, because uh, intra arthroscopically, I had repaired the posterior part of the graft to the upper part of the infraspinatus. So that was also intact. So there was a, uh, still a reduced action rotation was present. The power was reduced, but the patient did not have exactly the action rotation lag sign that comes positive in complete years. So she didn't have that. Had it been, so I would have to repair uh, those uh, also. But teres minor was definitely 100% intact. There was no problem. Upper part of infraspinatus because it uh, the upper part of infra overlaps in insertion with the supraspinatus. So some part of that was torn. I had repaired that with the uh, posterior border of the graft. Excellent. I think that was a well. But uh, for some other, I would also like to ask Raju sir's opinion and I think somehow I, I had some quality time with Mihata and this thing, but I was never able to reproduce the CR results in my own hands. What I would have personally gone in this particular case would be a ca ideal candidate for muscle transfer because I have a clause, uh, not an arthritic shoulder related, definitely not a RSA. 60 is comparatively young, no RSA. I would juggle in between a lat transfer or a roll trap transfers, but with the infra, I mean, you know, uh, my point of decision between these two would be an intactness of the TDs and all. And having said that, it is partially repairable. One thing that literature has clearly shown us when you're able to add a muscle transfer, whether a lat or a lower trap, with a partially repairable cuff, I think that produce excellent outcome in terms of of course, not complete strength back, but in terms of outcome as well. Uh, but uh, I, I would I would love to ask Raju sir's opinion in this case. But if, having seen your case, it was perfectly done. I have nothing to do that. But I, I personally could not reproduce the SCR outcomes myself. And, uh, Raju, and sir, you are have... very well presented, very good results. But uh, I generally don't do an SCR. And if you read the 
upcoming gen journal article, especially there was a editorial uh, called the S curve of uh, superior capsular reconstruction. Probably it's on the way out. Uh, I don't know. I, it has never appealed to me logically as well. I don't do it in my practice. And the other perspective, muscle transfers, they should be done with extreme caution in uh, Indian patients because rehab. So these typically, unfortunately, happen to ladies. And uh, they generally are not able to comply with the rehab. The lower trap transfer is a very morbid operation. And uh, I am saying this with personal experience of treating a patient who is the relative of a very, very prominent shoulder surgeon based out of UK. And he said that I'm not going to do a tendon transfer uh, for this patient. We had posted the lady for a tendon transfer together. He said that uh, she will not be able to comply with the rehab. So that is something you can do an excellent operation, but it will be totally screwed by the lack of rehab from the patients. And uh, I would encourage everyone to read a recent paper in the American Journal of Sports Medicine extreme medialized rotator cuff repair. So even in a potentially irreversible cuff tear scenario, even if you are able to repair it in an extreme medialized way, as I routinely do in my practice, the patients will be happy. So patients will develop some compensatory mechanisms around it. It's only very rarely that you need to resort to these uh, uh, drastic procedures. And uh, generally with good releases, uh, we both watched the Dr. Ashish's video on the muscle advancement that he showed. That again seems a little drastic, but my aim is that you can probably repair. Uh, and in this, I would echo the views of uh, my mentor, Dr. Sanjay Desai, that I hardly find irreparable tears in my practice, at least in my hands. I'm able to repair most of them reasonably. Thank you. Thank you, Rajasar, sir, for the output. Uh, can, do we have any other questions in the panel? Okay. Uh, if you, I would just add, like to add one point. Uh, Dr. Raj, uh, sir has said, actually, uh, for, about the muscle transfer. I have done a few cases of muscle transfer also. I do uh, latissimus dorsi transfer. So I did that arthroscopically and that was for posterior superior uh, tears and uh, with external rotational lag signs. So I attached the lat dos to the infraspinatus and repaired the supraspinatus. Until now, uh, in that those few cases, it has given good results because definitely what sir said, they did a good rehab. They, did, they kept coming to me till one year and awesome. they did a good rehab. That is a very important, uh, very important thing for a good outcome, definitely. And I think just adding on a small point, what I observed between using lat and uh, lower trap, as uh, Basam always keeps on pointing out, lower trap is thought to be slightly rehab friendly because it's a synergistic muscle. It is easier to educate the patient. It is easier to train the patient. In lat, we need to re-educate an anterior to a posterior muscle. Of, of course, as Rajusa said, both of them require some kind of persistent rehab, at least for the initial two to three months. But uh, yes, lower trap can be a bailout option, I Uh, do we have uh, any more burning questions from the audience side on YouTube or Isha? Do we, uh, I just tried to ask the all the uh, panelists, uh, do we have uh, balloon spaces available in India as of yet? Uh, anyone has used them for subarcomial uh, space? They are likely to be sold and as hotcakes in India since the Lancet paper proved that they don't work. So we in India are very fond of the Guri Champi, so we are going to jump on the balloons. Uh, I am quite sure companies will bring them and they'll give all kind of data. But if you read the paper by uh, the Lancet uh, group, uh, by uh, uh, I think the Leicester group of uh, shoulder surgeons, uh, Monty Pandey, he clearly disproved. Uh, I mean, they had to abandon the trial midway because it was proving to be too costly to the NHS for a thing which doesn't work. I think uh, Raju sir rightly pointed it out. Uh, it's, it's just adding on a picture frame phenomenon. Here in Dubai, it is available. I I have used them uh, just for the sake of using them to have an eye, as Raju sir has said. But what I would, as he rightly pointed out, there is no phenomenon to that except for just a pain relief for some management. Otherwise, there's, there's just a cost factor. So I think we come to the end of this beautiful webinar. Uh, anybody, uh, Sandeep, any moment questions or we'll, we'll conclude the... Uh...
I think he's left. Dr. Nadesh is there. I yeah, think we, yeah, can... yeah. we should conclude, I think. So uh, I think I would take this opportunity to thank everyone, especially Dr. Raju Ishwaran, sir, who needs no introduction by himself. And uh, those points were really helpful. I think one thing by this academic corner is we uh, want people to learn some ticks and trips, share all the experiences and Dr. JP's interesting case. That was mind blowing going front, back, all together and showing us everything worked. And uh, again, the interesting case by Nitesh showing about SCR and everything. It was an overall an academic piece. That, uh, I think we should enjoy that. Uh, thank you for all being here. And uh, thank you, Raju, sir, as well. Thanks for your excellent moderation, as usual, Karthik and uh, Soham. And, uh, thank you. Thank listening you. to the cases and uh, especially the Kasar Gold was amazing. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Hope thank to meet you all soon. In person. Definitely. Thank you. 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 Thank you.